we continue in the discussion with uh, the building of Mishkan. Uh, also, we have the golden calf, um, the, uh, the tablets. Um, it seems like uh, two sort of broad sides of, uh, of, of a perspective. You talk about Mishkan, and then all of a sudden we'll get into the golden calf, but there, there is a, a rhyme and a reason to this, and hopefully we can gather that today. I'm going to go over briefly sort of the outline of what is happening. Now, as I've said, in, in the last couple of portions, we've had extensive discussion about the, uh, the Mishkan. Um, we understand about its building, et cetera, et cetera. In this text, it starts off about every Jew should be uh, given a, a half shekel toward the building of the Mishkan. And these coins will also be used to count for the Jews, somewhat of, of a census. There is a wash basin that needs to be built. That wash basin sits between the tent of meeting and the altar, and it is to be placed in the Mishkan, and Aaron and his sons uh, should wash their feet and their hands, perform the service. Uh, there's some understanding about that. We understand that the women uh, presented their mirrors for, uh, for the purpose of making this basin. It said that the women didn't give up, uh, especially the, the Hebrew women, didn't give up their jewelry and mirrors, etc., for the worship or the building of the golden calf. And therefore, there was uh, a purity, a light that, that uh, came from that. Uh, there is a recipe of oil with spices to be described. Uh, with Moses is to make this and... Um, and pour on the Mishkan. It was about the anointing of its vessels, et cetera, et cetera, making them holy for use or set aside or de uh, uh, dedicated for the use of the temple only. And we can remember within the Torah law that there was, it was prohibited to use any of the instruments of the temple for common use. I mean, pretty clear uh, approach that uh, if that were to take place, then it was no longer consecrated or dedicated to the temple. Uh, the next thing was described a secret recipe for the ketoret, uh, the, the sacrifice of incense that is to go on the, on the altar. And then there is Bazael and Oliab who were put in charge of the building of the Mishkan. It said that the Shekinah, the divine inspiration, descended upon them. They were given special knowledge and understanding in the use, for example, of the Hebrew letters to understand how to build these mechanisms and the process. You know, anybody can come up with an idea, but it takes a very special gifting to actually know how to implement the idea. Uh, the, the Jews received the commandment for Shabbat, the keeping of the Shabbat, and how incredible that is. We understand that Shabbat is at this time the only way that the, the um, or the, the primary way that the Jewish people bring in the light of the divine presence into the world is through Shabbat. And all of this came with the advent of the golden calf. You see, the people before the golden calf, to include Moshe, radiated a light. There was a, a energy that flowed from them. Uh, uh, we see this when, uh, after the golden calf, that Moses, when he went up and came back down, he radiated so brightly that he had to cover his face. He couldn't even walk out uh, without people squinting. The light was so bright. After the Jews had heard of the words of the Ten Commandments at Sinai, Moses went up to the mountain to receive the two tablets from God, and the Jews uh, know he is supposed to come down after 40 days, uh, but they miscalculated the days, they become worried, uh, they didn't know whether he was going to come down, what's going to happen, we're not going to have a leader that's going to lead us, and uh, they decided to build a golden calf and to make it an idol, serving and worshiping and bringing its sacrifices. Clearly, there is uh, on itself the basic explanation that idolatry is wrong. 
very clear, every one of us who came out of the nations clearly understand what idolatry is now. The problem is that often it is oversimplified and not examined at its fullest, uh, fullest level. When God sees that they had built this golden calf, became angry, he wanted to destroy the whole Jewish nation. It said that the host of angels came down and collected the, the crowns of the people because it's, it's like they lost this divine energy that radiated from them when they did this. They darkened themselves. They didn't illuminate themselves. When he sees this, uh, Moses takes the tablets down the mountain. When he hears the camp of Israelites dancing and singing, convoiting around this golden calf and the, the, the um, what do you call it, the, um, uh, the people of the nations that came out. Uh, when he hears the camp of the Jews, sees the golden calf, he throws the tablets down and he destroys the tablets. We understand that the destruction of the tablets helped to bring about the salvation of the Jewish people, because if not, they would have had to been judged completely by the laws that were within those tablets. And before it even came down and was seen by their own eyes, they had violated that Torah. The idea is that um, miraculous events rarely cement dedication and integrity before our God. And I'll explain this a little bit more in a moment. It says, Moses then goes back to God and prays for the Jews, and he even tells God that if he, if he will forgive them of their sins, God would take his name out of the entire Torah. Just do that. If you're, gonna, if you're not going to forgive them and you're going to destroy them, then remove my name from the Torah. And of course, God said uh, God sh uh, should take his name out of the Torah. God's forgiveness came upon the Israelite people. And we see that God's name is out of the next portion that comes. God tells Moses that when he, that, uh, he will now send an angel to accompany them. Uh, and, but Moses says that they refuse to go unless God himself comes along. And also God agrees that he himself will accompany the Jews to the Holy Land. Moses prepares a new set of tablets and goes up again to the mountain so God can inscribe the Ten Commandments on them. And in on the mountain, Moses sees the vision of the glory of God, and that glory of God or the essence of God that he wanted to see was, in essence, this Torah that he's going to carry down. I've said this many times. People want to see the true essence of the Holy One, blessed be he, but he has no form. He's not a man. He his essence can't be seen with human eyes, but the only way that we can see the essence of the Holy One, blessed be He, is through the Torah and understanding the Torah. Now, with that, I would like to bring sort of a sure uh, discussion about idolatry and how damaging it is and how easy it is to uh, form idolatrous views. Now, look, I'm not bashing anybody of any religion. Everybody has their own journey. Everybody has to seek a way to find the Blessed One. Even in Judaism, there are people who have turned their religion into golden calves, and I'll explain to you what that means. The question is, is how many have actually turned their Judaism or their Christianity or their whatever into their own golden calf? Now, to say it about Judaism or about Jews seems to be a huge indictment, but understand, I'm not talking about the whole of Judaism. I'm talking about individuals who have put another face on God, who have taken the mechanics of the religion and the beautiful form and its wisdom and let that become the Holy One. Unfortunately, that is the case. Um, now, the idea is that the Tor Judaism gets turned into a golden calf when Tor gets stripped down only a religion of Jewish prudence or Jewish prudence or social uh, systems. 
with its spiritual teachings and messages lost and being portrayed as only a religion or a ritual or a practice or a custom or a, a, a tradition of a nation, each of which have nothing to do with the or original sources of classic spiritual Torah, meaning that is, that is in essence, idolatry. All this is as worshiping a false face of the Holy One, Yud Chevavche. By creating a false face for religion, they equally create a false face for God. Who is supposed to be found within religion? It is supposed to be the Holy One, blessed be He. In their quest for religious piety, and I'm talking about all religious people, with their stricter and stricter approaches to the law, with uh, without spiritual meaning or devotion, they have built for themselves a molded calf. Instead of uh, instead of Moshe, it's the golden calf. They were not thinking in terms of being anti-God. They were not thinking in terms of let's worship another God. They were thinking in terms let's worship God through the image of this golden calf. And look, maybe this needed to happen so that the people would not worship Moses, that finally they would realize you can't put Moses in such a position that he becomes like your demagogue or your small God. This way of Judaism, of religion without spiritual awareness is not Torah Judaism at all, but as worshiping another God, a new golden calf. And we all have too many golden calves today. It's very easy to develop them, and it's very easy to say, well, this is not idolatry, but this is my method of connecting to God. Even I would even say pseudo-spirituality is another type of golden calf. You can mean well, but it could be wrong if your wisdom, if the illumination, if the knowledge doesn't come from Torah, Judaism, then what do you have? It's just another religion or another God with another face. Uh, the Riesh Lachesh says, the Holy One, blessed be he, will be, will in the future return the crowns to the people, the Jewish people. Those redeemed by God will return and come to Zion with song and everlasting happiness upon their heads. It says in the Parsha, you shall not have your bags uh, filled with different weights. You remember the weights and measurements issue? It's a huge violation and injustice. We understand that, that if your religion doesn't produce a lifestyle behavior of, of justice, of purity, of kindness to your fellow, then you have found yourself a pseudo-religion and not true Torah uh, Judaism. And when I say Torah Judaism, I'm also talking about Torah Judaism for the non-Jewish person. Uh, when we say that we follow uh, Judaism, every one of us do, but the, those who are from the nations follow a Judaism that has been ascribed for the non-Jew from the Torah. The prophets say much concerning about this whole idea of social injustice and e economic op oppression. Uh, Isaiah says, woe to those who join house to house, field to field, uh, and, and settle there in the midst of the land. It says that they created a situation where there was no room for the poor. Do you get this idea that their farms, their lands, their houses were right up against each other, and there was no place for a poor person to, to uh, <coughs> find land or to farm, and he or she would have to go way out in the middle of nowhere where there wouldn't be support, and it was, it was absolutely uh, a horrible way to treat a person of poverty. Why is this mentioned? Why is this brought up at this time? Because the essence of true spiritual connection with the creator of the universe comes down uh, to how you treat your fellow. Holiness comes not from how holy I can, I can demonstrate to God or treat God in such a reverent, pious manner, but holiness is how I treat you and how you treat me and how I treat those around me. True holiness is sort of translated in the depths of, if you want to understand the measure of your depth of spirituality and connection to God, look at your spirituality and connection 
to your fellow, to your person, to your neighbor. We live in a situation where we, uh, especially those of us who, who find ourselves on this journey uh, to Jewish wisdom for the non-Jew, and uh, we tend to sometimes disconnect ourselves from our social family that we used to belong to just because it's such an alien place uh, to us now. However, it is important to remember that you are the only spark of divine light in, in your world. You are created to bring about divine understanding to the nations, to the people around you, not as missionaries, but as an, or, as an organic expression of the holiness of God in the world. Now, we understand the power of, of connecting to God in its pure sense. Every one of you do, because you're sitting here as a product of people that were raised in a religious environment, a religious system that brought you to a closer place in relationship with, with God, but yet you found yourself lacking wisdom and knowledge that should be automatically produced from that relationship. And then when you begin to study the wisdom of Torah, and you begin to read the sages of Torah Judaism and to find this rich knowledge that connect you with God in a very special, unique way, you discover that this connection with God, this holiness, this special divine, uh, uh, what do you call it, plug-in, wasn't something that was far, far away. It wasn't in Israel. It wasn't in the temple. It wasn't in, in, uh, in some uh, temple in a, a pagan environment. It was simply on our lips. It says that the Torah, the light of the Torah, comes from our mouth because we bring it into our mind and into our body. The Torah is right here. That when we speak the Torah, when we, uh, when we study the Torah, we're infusing the world with light, whether you realize it or not. You're not going to feel it, but most definitely you're going to understand that it has an impact in the world that we live. So let me wrap it up with this. The challenge would be in all of our lives as we read this is how do we take in the knowledge that we're given in this Parsha, the building of the, of the tabernacle, uh, the Shekinah, the divine presence wanting to rest amongst the people, this idea that the Jewish people lost their crowns, they lost this great light that they had when they turned their face toward and saw this this uh, golden calf being built. And look, the Israelite people, most of them didn't participate. It was only 3,000 people, but they watched it take place. They observed this thing going on and it dimmed them in so many aspects. We're living in an age in which people are trying to retrieve that great light. And I want to remind those who are searching, whether it be as a Noahide or a fellow uh, I mean, as a, as a Jewish person or anybody in the nations, look for the pure source. Don't get so caught up in, in, the, in the religious aspect of things that you forget your single motivation was to use that as a vehicle to, to connect to the Holy One. The idea of coming to Torah Judaism wasn't to uh, become, uh, what do you call it, more educated as much as we approach this in the beginning because we wanted to be close to Hashem. We wanted to understand him and to know him. And that is what the Torah has done for all of us. The warning is for us to not make that system into just another religion. There are people that have left Christianity and they have merely brought with them all of of the mechanisms that are in Christianity and sort of try to adapt a bastardized Judaism for their own selves, that is a false God. Anybody that is involved in a system, and I know the purity in which they are trying to approach this, but the Israelite people and the Erev Rav that was in, in, in the wilderness at the time, they were not intentionally being evil people. They sincerely wanted to connect to God. They truly felt like that they had been abandoned. The idea that if we put our hope in any man, if we put our hope in systems that is outside of God himself, 
then we will have begun to approach a new life, not in relationship to God, but to another image that is not God. So that concludes the, the discussion. Let's get into um, open the floor, see what you guys think. Any ideas that you would like to share? Now would be the time. 